Hi, everyone. Now in this session, we're going to uh, talk a little bit of uh, what species distribution models are and uh, what's the logic behind, what's the theory behind, what applications we can, we can, we can use for these models, and um, also some general uh, terms and, and methods. And at the end, we'll just wrap this up and, and make some key messages. So that's the idea of, of, of this session. Today, some introduction, applications, basic terms, a general uh, modeling framework, and at the end, some, some key messages. So what are mainly species distribution models? First, in order to, to ask or answer that question, I would like you to think for a moment, if you just think of any species that you like, uh, you're interested at, or that could be any, any species. Why you find that species in that particular place where you found it? And also, why is a species not where it's not? So uh, this would lead to different factors affecting whether a species is or is not in certain location. And if we just uh, adopt one of these species, uh, this mushroom might be quite common to some of you. Um, it's quite commercial uh, mushroom in, in Finland. Some of you might know it's, it's Cantarelli. Um, if we think about the same questions about these species in particular, why is that species there in that particular location? And why that species might not be in, in any location? So which factors are affecting whether that species is where it is? Some of you might uh, mention certain factors um, such as the moist, levels there, or the temperature might be important, or the type of soils might be particular, so that species is there. Uh, for those of you that are interested in mushroom picking, perhaps you might be aware that perhaps this species likes areas where um, the soils are relatively dense, so you might find it uh, in, in forest paths where, or trails so that those, those soils are relatively more dense compared to others, and it often grows in those, those places. Also, you might have heard that there's uh, some sort of symbiosis between these species and other trees, such as uh, birch. So that's why, for instance, it has been said that it's quite difficult to, to commercially uh, harvest or, or grow these, these mushrooms in, in other areas rather than in nature. So, there are different factors affecting species distribution. And uh, in the last session, we asked this question to the participants. Um, so what factors actually limit species distribution? And uh, we, ha we got quite a lot of, of, of answers, but uh, mainly all of these answers, such as climatic conditions, uh, again, climate, uh, Temperature, temperature. So many of the of, of the participants actually uh, identify us as climate as a certain key factors affecting the, the distribution of species, but also other types of factors were mentioned, such as soils or uh, topography, and uh, similarly other types of of, of variables um, such as predation, competition, uh, different biotic interactions, which also shape uh, whether a species is uh, where it is. So we got quite a lot of, 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 of answers, and uh, we discussed that all of these uh, we could just classify in a simple way in, in abiotic factors, such as climatic uh, variables, and uh, soil, for instance, topography, and other uh, variables such as biotic factors, uh, such as interactions uh, with other species, predation, competition, and, and so on. And also something that was also mentioned is that whether a species might be able to reach that area, if there's any accessibility 
uh, limitations, some barriers of movement. Um, so that was also mentioned here. So, so it was really nice to, to have this, this question from, from, from you. But we could also adopt other species. And in this case, you see a photo of, uh, of Brazilian nut, um, tropical tree that grows in, in the Amazon. And perhaps you're not uh, that familiar itself with the tree, but I'm pretty sure that you, have, you might have seen or even uh, eaten uh, the seeds that, that this tree provides. And as I mentioned, this tree uh, grows in, in, the, in the Amazon. And in this, in this figure, in this map, uh, you can see locations, those dots are locations where these species have been uh, recorded. And on, 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 on the bottom, you see a layer of, of, of mean annual temperature in South America. So if you, if you just uh, take a look at, at that graph, you, you might realize that, that these species is mainly located in areas that are relatively warm. So they're not growing or they're not located in these bluish uh, areas which are colder areas, but they are rather in, in these more red uh, locations which represent areas that are above, let's say, 25 degrees in annual temperature. These layers and these uh, locations uh, are freely available. We're going to go in the course later on um, where we can get downloads. And we can also uh, use other types of, of variables or layers to see, to just visual, visually assess where the species is um, located, which might be also indicative of the conditions that the species might also prefer. And in this case, it's a layer of uh, animal precipitation. And uh, the bottom layer is uh, the blue areas that you see are areas that have uh, higher rainfall. And then the more uh, yellow or let's say beige colors are areas that are pretty dry, let's say. And also just visually assessing, we, 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 could, we could agree that, that this, um, this species is located in areas that are relatively, let's say humid. Uh, we're talking about, let's say more than uh, 2,500 or 2,000 millimeters of, of rainfall per year, which is, which is uh, quite a lot. So we, we can start doing this with different types of, of variables and, and, and environmental layers. In this case, it was just climate, but we can also take a look at different variables such as uh, soil characteristics. In this case, this cation exchange capacity, which mainly is it's an ind indicator of, of potentially how, how fertile soil could be. And, uh, here in this picture, we, we can we can see that this this plot, this uh, location where the species Brazilian nut is, has been recorded, is growing in quite varied uh, soil conditions. In this case, it's the high exchange capacity. It's, let's say it's not it's not located in the in the areas where there's higher concentra higher concentration <coughs> or higher values of this cation exchange capacity, but it's uh, located in in, in quite a uh, varied range. It's not really clear to see whether it prefers really rich soil or poor soil necessarily, but it's occurring in quite a, a, a broad, broad range, but not, let's say, in the, in the most, most rich uh, areas here, for instance, following these dark colors. And the idea behind fish distribution models is that we will be able to to see these, these uh, patterns in the geographic space. And what I mean in the geographic space is um, the, the layers that we just saw, different uh, available uh, layers of environmental data, such as temperature, rainfall, soils, it could be other types of variables that are uh, existing. And also in the geographic space, we're also referring to the occurrence data, the species occurrence data. In this case, we will see an example of Brazilian nut tree. But it's uh, mainly the, the coordinates or the location where the species has been uh, recorded, or it could be also in areas where we know that the species is not uh, there. 
but this is uh, when I refer to the geographic space, I refer to these components, environmental data and occurrence data. But we could also visualize um, this environmental data and this occurrence data, not in a geographic space, but also in an environmental space. And how can we do that? So here we have, uh, let's say, all South America. And now we see this initial uh, layer, which is, was mean annual temperature. We see colors here, but actually there's numbers uh, in, in each of those locations, and that's why we're seeing a color. So um, higher values are represented in, in, in more warm colors or more red colors. So if we uh, extract all of these values from South America, all of those temperature values, and uh, we can plot them in, in, in a graph, and also we can extract values, for instance, of all the uh, rainfall conditions in South America. And if we do so, we can have, for instance, here we see a 3D graph where we see uh, rainfall here, and then we have in this other axis mean, minimum temperature, and here we have maximum temperature. So all of those values uh, from all South America, we can extract and plot here. And those are the, the black box that you see in this graph. And we can do the same exercise, but uh, from only the locations or the, or the coordinates where the species has been recorded. And all of those, uh, here we see these green uh, uh, points, we can also extract these values uh, from, from these layers and plot them here. And this area, which is in green, represents uh, from all of those available environmental conditions in South America, where only is located these species, from these species uh, locations or records. So here we see this in the geographic space, but here we can represent it also in the environmental space. What species distribution model does itself is try to, to, to delimit or model these areas here in the environmental space with different sort of algorithms. There's many, many different uh, methodologies available uh, to choose different algorithms. And the idea is to model this environmental space back in the, in the geographic space. So the idea is that we would uh, find uh, potentially or, or in areas that we don't have uh, field data, we don't have species records, we could estimate whether that species might uh, be there or not whether those areas based on these environmental variables uh, are suitable for this species or not. So the idea behind species distribution models is that based on, on in areas where we know, uh, in this case, if the species is there, we could estimate in which other places where we don't have field data yet, we could uh, assess whether there is a suitable environment for that species or if there is any, let's say, probability of finding that species. There. So this is a really uh, quick summary of what species distribution models are. Uh, so <clears throat> we just define this, uh, what species distribution models are. So it's a set of tools that, first of all, we characterize the environmental conditions that are suitable for the species. So that, I mean, when we were referring to the environmental space, so we, we identify those limits, those conditions where the, where the species is um, located or where the species or environments are suitable. For the species. And also it would be uh, this, this set of tools, the species distribution models would be able to identify uh, where these suitable environments are located, but in the geographical space. So that's the idea behind species distribution models. They have been often referred with many terms uh, when we are describing the species niche, uh, species distribution models have been also referred as ecological niche models or niche models. And also when describing habitat suitability, they have been referred to as habitat suitability models. These are different terms, but uh, in the end, they, they might focus on different parts of the, of the, of the whole, um, this, this whole graph that we saw before, but the idea behind them is, is the same. 
if we want to focus only on the environmental um, space, then we might be referring to ecological niche model. If we're only interested in, in, and we focus on, on the geographical space, then we might be referring to species distribution models or other species models. Uh, some applications or why um, we model species distributions. Uh, a, a big ecological uh, idea behind this, first of all, to understand the relationship between species and its abiotic and biotic environment. So just to know, uh, understand what are these uh, suitable conditions for each species. But also, since we can um, estimate or predict whether a species might be present or not in areas where we don't have uh, field information, we can uh, use this as a surrogate. We can, we can make these predictive maps. So that's really a key part here in species distribution models. Since we often uh, refer that we don't have enough data, we don't have uh, enough collections, and uh, the idea is to use the existing data to try to estimate where uh, these, these, all these species might be located. And this has many practical implications. For instance, uh, in reserve design and conservation planning, if you think about uh, an endangered species that uh, we don't have much data, we don't have much information about it, but there's few, few points, few locations where we, we know that species has been uh, recorded. Well, we can use those, those, um, those data and try to model and, and predict in which other locations uh, there might be some suitable environment. For and hence, those layers, those predictive maps of these endangered species might be useful for, for, for instance, creating new conservation areas, for, for planning new conservation areas, and so on. So that's one, one big part of species distribution model. Also for environmental impact assessments, so in case you're not familiar with the term, uh, any development project, any, let's say, infrastructure projects, such as roads, mining, energy projects, in order to start constructing their, 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 their infrastructure, they need uh, to assess whether their, their, their infrastructure might affect or have an impact on the environment. And the same, the same idea behind if there might be some uh, key species or endangered species uh, around, we can also use these species distribution models to, to make some uh, estimates if the species might be present or there might be suitable conditions for these species within this, this project or this infrastructure area. So that's why it has been also used for, for environmental impact assessments. Similarly, if we think about uh, commercial or um, useful, important species, it could be the mushroom that we mentioned before, it could be three uh, species that are important for livelihood economic aspects. We can also uh, <clears throat> make these predictive maps and then we would also use these predictive maps for, for instance, forest management or natural resources management practices. <clears throat> also related, um, if we know that there are key species or, or endangered species prefer certain uh, ecosystems, certain suitable uh, environments, and perhaps those, those environments have been uh, historically affected. There's been quite a lot of pressure in ecosystems. So we could also uh, use these layers to tackle areas that might be potential for, for, the, for certain species, but they have been, let's say, affected in the past. So we could, we could do some effort in those areas to increase the habitat quality. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there are different factors affecting the distribution of species. Uh, some abiotic factors such as climate, temperature, uh, rainfall, soils, and so on, but also uh, we mentioned biotic factors such as um, interactions, uh, predation, competition, and so on, and also uh, accessibility to, to, to species, or if there's any barriers, any limits of movement. And this is important since if an area might have both biotically and abiotically suitable conditions, but there's some limit 
there, there's there's some some barrier that certain species cannot reach there. But uh, due to uh, many factors, including, for instance, uh, transportation, or or if you think about uh, shipping industry and so on, there's quite a lot of of, of of potentiality of moving species from one place to another out of their natural range. So these limits of barriers, if you think about barriers, it could be uh, mountain cha chains, it could be islands, and so on. So then, if these limits are or these barriers are are suppressed by transporting certain species, then these potentially invasive species could thrive in areas where naturally didn't didn't occur. So this is another way of, of using species distribution models to assess which areas might be suitable for these species out of their natural range. And also uh, related to this, uh, there have been quite a lot of uh, applications when we are modeling the distribution of species only using climate data. So we're modeling the, let's say, the climatically suitable environment for the, for the species. There's quite a lot of uh, models already, uh, scenarios of, of climate change, what can happen in 50 years, what can happen later on, according to the scenarios. And we can um, model how the distribution of these species is going to change. So mainly that's a little bit of the, of the practicalities. We're going to check some, some papers later of, of two case studies where you will be uh, seeing a practical use of, of these species. Uh, modeling. Then um, it's important to, to have some basic uh, terms, to have basic understanding of, on, on, on the big amount of terms that have been used so far. It's a re recipe, uh, relatively recent um, set of or line of study, let's say from 2000 or even before, but there has been a uh, a boom in, in, the, in the use or the publishing of, of species distribution models papers. And hence, uh, there's quite a lot of terms and there has been a lot of confusion on, on, on certain aspects. So the idea behind this part of the, the session is to clarify some of these uh, terms. Most of the information that I'll present here has been uh, taken from these three really, really awesome books. Um, if someone is interested, you can just uh, take a look at, at them. Um, uh, this initial book is, is, is one of the first, these two are one of the first to try to summarize, compile all the, all the, all the background information, try to, to propose theories behind, and, and this later is it's a little bit more, more recent and with practical applications in, in, in R, of more of these pieces. In, but to understand a little bit of, of, of this, I think it's important to know what a niche is. <clears throat> uh, a niche, uh, and one definition is a subset of, of the environmental conditions where species uh, have positive growth rates, so where species is, is, can, can occur, can live. So a part of the environmental conditions which are suitable for species. And uh, these have often been referred to Grinnellian uh, niche uh, because it goes kind of in line with, with uh, the theory behind or the, the theory proposed by, by Grinnell that these environmental factors are, our climatic factors are, are taking species, distribution of species. But I, I wouldn't go into much details on this, but um, niche has also been defined as the requirements of, of resources and interactions for, for species. So more of, of, of a bio, uh, biotic factor. And this has been often referred to Eltonian niche, since Elton uh, was talking mainly about the, the niche as a role for, for species. And also later on, Hutchinson defined niche as a multidimensional space of environmental conditions affecting species. And, uh, and then later on, uh, he made a, a division or, or, or clearly defined that 
this uh, multidimensional environmental space, which we define as niche, uh, could be divided in, 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 two, in two or two factors that might be useful for defining this bionomic variables or what we also call, or what are also called linked variables. And then he also put uh, another term for these xenopoetic variables, which are also related to non-linked variables. I think these terms might be um, quite confusing, um, but by bionomic variables or, or um, xenopoetic variables, uh, the idea is uh, that they also also been referred to direct variables or indirect variables. And if you see the colors here, uh, the red colors are referring to environmental conditions, these xenopoetic variables, and direct variables. All of these are mainly, if we just want to summarize and, and simplify it, they're mainly referring to abiotic conditions, where the uh, abiotic environmental conditions for a species whereas the more light blue colors are mainly referring to these biotic interactions and, and some sort of, of linking uh, factors. <clears throat> and also later on, ecological niche have been referred to both. It's a combination of both. A range of conditions necessary for, for a species and also its ecological role. So when we refer to niche, we, we, sh we should keep in mind that it's, 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 a, it's, it's a component of, of multi-environmental uh, factors affecting the species. And these, uh, these, these environmental factors are, are ranging from, from, from climatic variables, from abiotic variables, for instance, to biotic uh, interaction. And these, these factors, these biotic factors, abiotic factors um, that determine species distribution are scale dependent. Where I mean here by scale, I, I, I refer to the geographic extent, so broad, broad extent of global scale and local scale. In this table, um, you can see that uh, different types of environmental variables uh, play different roles in shaping species distribution at different scales. For instance, climate um, mainly is, is an initial filter, environmental filter at broad scale. It's the, 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 the first broad filter for, for shaping species distribution. Weather or, or at, at more local scales, at smaller uh, ranges, biotic interactions play a key role in filtering uh, as an environmental filter, let's say whether a species might be present or not. Um, there's been lots of terms, lots of terminology, uh, concepts uh, referring to these, these, these broad uh, classes of, or, or types of variables. On one hand, uh, xenopoetic variables defined by Hutch, Hutchinson are also referred to non-linked variables, such as temperature, rainfall, they're often measured at broad spatial scales that have an indirect effect. Usually, they're referring to abiotic factors. And for practical reasons, uh, we're referring to these variables as abiotic factors. And all of these other type of variables, as, as defined by Hutchinson, bionomic variables, they have also been referred to dynamic, dynamical link variables such as consumed resources. They're often measured at finer spatial scales, more, more local scales, uh, often have a direct effect on the species, and they're often or usually biotic factors. So for practical reasons, we'll just be referring to these variables as biotic. And uh, as I mentioned, climate or, or abiotic factors play uh, you go uh, at broad scale as a first environmental filter for shaping species distribution, whereas a more local scale, uh, biotic interactions play a key role in, in shaping species. Um, so we have seen already these 
but just as a recap, we, we, we have data where species might be located. And then we also might have uh, accessible environmental layer. So the idea is to combine these and, 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 and see which in the environmental space, which environmental conditions are, are which, where these species are located in this environmental range, in this multidimensional space. Here we just see in three uh, dimensions, but it could be N dimensional space. And the idea is to try to find these areas back in the geographic space. So that's kind of like the, the idea behind So when we refer to species distribution models, we need to clearly uh, define whether we're talking about the geographic space or the environmental space. As we define. Here we see an image of, of, of part of South America, Central America, and, and North America. And uh, in this other uh, graph, we see just two environmental conditions from all of this area as we mentioned before, if we just extract all different uh, environmental conditions from all this area, each of these uh, dots represent uh, the environmental conditions. Okay. So both the rapid space and environmental space. And another term that is, is, is important to, to know is uh, what was, has been called as hatching from duality. What what this Hutchinson duality mean uh, in theory. So for each location in the geographic space, there is one value in the environmental space, all right? But for each value in the environmental space, there might be more than one location in the geographic space. Uh, to make this a little bit more simple, if we think about uh, the mean average temperature in Turku, um, let's say that is around five degrees, the mean annual temperature. So one location where we are now, for instance, Turku, this location has five degrees mean annual temperature. But this five mean annual temperature uh, degree is only located in Finland, or there might be other places where there, it might be a uh, mean annual, annual temperature of five. Of course, there's many other places where there, uh, there could be uh, temperatures of such. So that's the idea of, of, of what Hutchinson duality mean. And this is key for understanding these species distribution models. If we're interested in knowing uh, where suitable conditions species might be, then this idea of, of swapping around uh, geographic and, and environmental spaces. Another important term, uh, is what is called the BAM diagram. It's a representation that would be uh, simple to visualize what, what uh, factors are affecting and how they're affecting the species distribution. By BAM diagram, I mean biotic, abiotic, and movement. So all the suitable abiotic conditions depicted as A, then those areas uh, where species is located in these conditions are often referred as a biologically suitable distribution. Then we also have B, which is the suitable biotic condition for the species. And then we also have M, which is refers to, to movement or let's say to whether an area is accessible for, for the species or not. So as we stated before, these three factors shape broadly the distribution of species. Both uh, abiotic and biotic conditions are important. And also whether certain area might be accessible for the species. And if we uh, overlap or, or, or yeah, overlap all of these, these three broad factors, then we'll be referring to the actual distribution. So areas that are both uh, biotically and abiotically suitable locations and they are accessible. Those areas that have uh, abiotically and biotically suitable conditions, but they are not accessible for the species due to some barriers or some limitations of movement, are referred to the uh, invadable 
is the voltage for the G I. So we have the abiotically suitable conditions, and then the areas located in those conditions are referred to, uh, always referred to abiotically suitable distribution of the species, which means that they are areas that contain abiotically suitable conditions required for a species. Then we have B again, which is the abiotically uh, suitable uh, conditions and the uh, areas that are both, uh, areas that contain both abiotically and biotically suitable conditions are referred to GP, which is called the potential distribution. And then if we add on top of that, areas that are accessible or not accessible to species, then uh, we might be referring to G O, which is the actual or occupied distribution. As I mentioned earlier, there are areas that contain both abiotically and biotically suitable conditions for the species, and there are areas that are accessible for the species. And uh, this other part of this BAM diagram is areas that uh, contain both abiotically and biotically suitable conditions, but they are not accessible to the species. There is some sort of barrier of movement that enables the species to be there or not to be there. And there are different configurations of these circles, different configurations of this BAM diagram. In this case, remember the, the red circle is abiotic condition or uh, The blue or light blue is biotic conditions, and the green is this accessibility or barriers of movement. What can we see from that combination of circles? Mainly, we're seeing that all the areas are accessible for the species. So in this case, accessibility is not limited. The species have, uh, can reach many areas. So in this case, there's no barriers, and, and that species might be able to move uh, throughout all that, those conditions. And then we might have other configurations, other sets of these uh, circles or, or of these BAM diagrams. In this case, what, what can we see here? Which variable or which type of factor is not limiting? The red one, right? So in this case, the abiotic conditions are not limiting. So the biotic conditions are playing a key role in this, in this configuration. And in this other uh, graph, we see that biotic conditions are not limiting, but the abiotic conditions are. So there are different configurations of this uh, BAM diagram according to your species, not only according to your species, but according to the study area where you are going to make the models. If it's quite a local, remember when we were talking about how these factors are scale dependent or how these factors play a key role in different extents. If we're uh, focusing on a really local, local scale, we're perhaps we'll be in a situation as the middle circle, where all the, let's say, imagine climate. The climate is quite, it's quite homogeneous in a small area. So the, the, those conditions are not limiting. But whereas we focus a little bit more on local scales, well, the biotic conditions might be more uh, important to shape those species distribution at that scale. If we go to the opposite side, if we're talking about really, really broad, broad, broad scale, like global, with more distribution of one species globally, then perhaps these climate factors might be uh, shaping the species distribution at broad scales. Uh, whereas the biotic conditions at that uh, resolution, at that uh, spatial extent, might not be uh, that important at that scale. So we might be referring or, or talking about a uh, BAM diagram like this one. But again, it depends on each species, it depends on each study area. But it's good in mind, it's good to keep in mind uh, how these three circles uh, play uh, an important role 
on, on the model. So now we're gonna see how this uh, BAM diagram is represented both in the geographic space and in the environmental space. So the abiotically suitable condition in this, in this figure is uh, depicted as those uh, red points or red dots in the map. So all of these uh, points are areas that have abiotically suitable areas for one species. And then we want to see that in the environmental space. Well, remember we have all of these possible or available environmental conditions in this study area. Well, those red locations in the geographic space can also be represented in the environmental space as these uh, red dots also. So if we delimit this area of a biotically suitable environment in this ellipse, all of those areas within that ellipse have been referred to the fundamental niche. All right. But only you see that within this uh, red ellipse, there are some areas that don't have dots, but we have delimited as such. But the existing dots here have been all often referred to the existing niche. So some terms to keep in mind in the geographic space and in the environmental space. Here, we're talking about abiotically suitable areas. Here, we might be talking about the fundamental niche or the existing niche in the environment. And then we can also add more, more factors of this uh, BAM diagram. So remember these red areas are uh, abiotic, abiotically suitable conditions in the geographic space. But let's say that these species have some barriers of movement. It can only occur within this uh, polygon within the boundaries of this polygon. So now we'll be referring uh, the intersection in the geographic space between these uh, areas would be exactly this intersection here. Has, there, there's no term for, for that area, but we can we can refer to it as uh, abiotically suitable areas that are accessible. Whereas these areas are abiotically suitable areas that are not accessible. And if we complicate this a little bit more, we can also add biotic factors. So remember this initial polygon represents barriers, areas that are accessible to this. But within these other polygons here and here, is areas that are suitable for the species or let's say air, biotic areas, um, biotic suitable areas. Let's say within those areas, there's uh, suitable uh, competition, there's suitable biotic interaction, there's uh, certain biotic factors that make those areas biotically suitable for this. So in this case, we are referring to these three uh, circles, right? So the intersection between areas that are both abiotically suitable, biotically suitable, and accessible for the species, this intersection, this GO, which is the occupied or actual distribution. And, but there are some areas here that they are both abiotically suitable and biotically suitable, but they are not accessible for the species. So that area has been referred to G. I. So the accessibility limit. And we can also see this in the environmental space. This is in the geographic space. And again, we can plot this in the, in the environmental space. Remember, these red ellipses are the abiotically suitable conditions. The red dots were the existing abiotically suitable conditions. But now we see also these uh, blue dots, which are within this area, uh, locations that are not only abiotically suitable, but also biotically suitable. 
in the environment. And this has been uh, referred to as the realized niche. So in the geographic space, we refer to it as the occupied or actual institution. Whereas in the environmental space, we refer to it as the realized niche. So now we'll uh, move a little bit quickly to the uh, modeling framework just as a broad uh, concept, how is, 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 is done. Uh, we'll go to more details about this in the practicals and in the next sessions. But we can see this model and framework in three steps. The first step is preparing our data. So we need to get data where the species is or where the species is not. And we need to uh, also obtain suitable or relevant environmental predictors. So this first step, uh, mainly refers to, to getting this data and preparing this data. The second uh, part, the second step in this modeling process is the actual modeling. So remember when we, we saw this uh, graph between the environmental and geographic space and we want to delimit that area in the environmental space, well that's the actual modeling. So we need to choose one algorithm to, for the modeling framework and we also need to set some parameters or tune or, or uh, think, let's say, our model for that uh, species distribution. And at the end, we have to know whether this, this model is good, right? We need to uh, evaluate uh, our model. And uh, we also need to predict it in the geographic space. So also that's part of the, of the third step. So this is in a, a really simple way, three steps for our model, and throughout the course we'll be referring to each of these three steps in different parts. For instance, here we might see we need to get or prepare our data, first step, data preparation. Then we need to uh, do the model, uh, the modeling uh, framework. So we need to choose one algorithm and we need to calibrate or let's say, Set the parameters and tune our models, and then we project these in the environmental, in the geographic space, and then we need to assess or evaluate uh, whether our models are good or not. And there's different algorithms available for doing uh, this species distribution model. We can uh, classify the, uh, these algorithms according to, to which data they require. For instance, if we talk about presence only, what are we referred by presence only? Uh, species occurrence, only presence where the species has been reported. So here we only use uh, data or the coordinates where the species has been recorded. So that's what I mean by presence only. And uh, this type of presence only models, there, there, there are several options, like right, such as bioclean, Euclidean distance and so on. So it's one type of, of available algorithms that you could use. Then there's other type uh, if you classify it as presence absence. What do I mean by presence absence? Presence, as I mentioned, is areas where we know or uh, the currents where we know that species is. And absence on the other hand would be locations where we know that the species is not. And, and this, this, has been, this could be problematic in many ways because often it's more interest or has been more studied where the, lo the location of species might be, not where it not might be. So when we look at the available data sources where species are, if we download information from different sources, we might uh, get uh, mainly a presence records, but not absence records. But we can also get absence records. For instance, if, you, if you're doing plant inventories and you go to the field and you uh, set some transects on the field, or you know which species are there and which species are not there. So if you're interested in one key species, you, that species might be in transect one, but not, not, it's not in transect two. So then the transect two, the location, might be used as a true absence for that. But in other uh, uh, groups, such as birds, it might be more complicated, this absence. Why? Because if I go also doing some, some field surveys, uh, some bird surveys, 
then I go, for instance, to Ruizalo, and then I, I start counting the birds that I see within, I don't know, a certain kilometers uh, radius, radius. Then I, I see certain species, but what happens if I don't see one species uh, there? Does it really mean that that species is not there? Or it might be that it just happened in that moment that I couldn't see due to the uh, weather conditions it might not be, due to the time of the year it might not be there. And there are so many factors why there might be an absence that is not a true absence, but it's more of a methodological absence, let's say. So, but there are many algorithms that we can, that use both types of data, presence and absence. And that could be, for instance, GLMs, GAMS, and support vector machine, and so on. One last set of algorithms, it's uh, what is called presence background or presence pseudo absence, where we use uh, species records where we know where the species is, the location. And then we also make a, a, a sampling, a random sampling of the study area and we extract random points. And then we'll use those random points as part of our model. And that has been often referred to present background or present pseudo absence. The modern algorithm that we would, we're gonna use in this, in this, in this model, in this course, is this presence uh, background and its maxims uh, algorithm. There are many, many more algorithms. For practical reasons, we're gonna use that one. In but there are so many options. Well, which one should I choose? Which one is better? So it depends, unfortunately, it depends. Uh, one way of, of, of filtering which algorithm I should choose or not is also according to what data you have from the species. If you have presence absence data, then you should use uh, those algorithms that, that enable you to, to use this presence absence data. But if you only have presence data, then, then you cannot use certain algorithms that require both presence absence. So the type of data of, of the species occurrence is a way of also filtering a little bit uh, which algorithms you can choose. Also, it might depend on your species. You might have uh, uh, quite rare or quite common uh, species. If it's quite rare, you might have just few few points, few locations where that species is. And that also might limit the, the algorithms that are available. Some algorithms work better uh, when you have lots of lots of points. Some algorithms might not perform that well when you have just few points. And also it might depend on your calibration and, and, and your, your study area, whether it's broad scale or fine scale. So there are many factors affecting, but uh, this has been assessed. There are many papers uh, using different algorithms for the same species and, and assessing which one is better for their purpose. And the idea is, is that there's no, um, there's no silver bullet, there's no perfect algorithm. One algorithm that was really good for my species and performed best might not be the same uh, best algorithm for you using other species or even the same species in a different so there is no silver bullet for this. And one common practice for this has been um, to use several algorithms at the same time. So using algorithm one, make one predictive map, an N type of, of, of algorithms. And then the idea is that you will do an ensemble model, combine all of these predictions. Uh, it could be an average of these predictions, or you could uh, make an ensemble model. So this has been also done quite a lot, not just choosing one algorithm, but choosing several options, and then making a, a summary or, or uh, an average model. So uh, to end already these, um, some key messages, some important things to remember is that species distribution models mainly characterize a species suitable environmental condition, and then tries to find locations where these suitable conditions are. These, these set of tools are relatively recent, and they have developed 
quite fast uh, in the past uh, years and every 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 month there's new papers new methodologies new suggestions and this there's quite a lot of uh, jargon and quite a lot of concepts often confusing it is important to differentiate and establish these relationships between the geographic space and the environmental space. Also, remember that both abiotic and biotic factors shape the distribution of species and are scale dependent. Often biotic factors act at finer scales, whereas uh, abiotic factors such as climate, let's say, act as a first filter, as, as a first environmental peak filter at broad scale. And also remember that not all areas might be accessible. To model the actual distribution, GO, or the realized niche, uh, we need both abiotic and biotic factors, as well as barriers of movement, if there is one. And there are many, many different approaches, different algorithms. There isn't a perfect or best algorithm, there's no two other bullets. And uh, the idea is that uh, one algorithm might be better for you and not, not for another area of the So that's what I wanted to show uh, now. So thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs>